Welcome back to Copenhagen, Tommy. It's good to be back. Yeah, it's good to have you back. Um, tomorrow you'll be showing a new documentary of yours. Could you just tell us a little bit about what this new documentary is about? It's about, it's an expose of the unholy alliance of the media, the government, um, and the judiciary. Currently in the, in the world, we're, we've seen today, Donald Trump is going to be face criminal charges. We've seen the weaponization of the judiciary for political purposes. This film proves how the judiciary has been used against me to silence and destroy my life. It's about a story. It's about a story that blew up in the north of England in the UK, where the entire story was fabricated and set up in order to push a narrative. The narrative was open border immigration and, and, and um, sympathy for refugees and the fact that English are racist. That, that was the narrative that was pumped and it was uh, something I reported on as a journalist. I was contacted by people at the time. When the story blew up on the, onto national headlines, I watched it blow up like everyone else. It was made. In, it, was made. It, wasn't a, it wasn't a world news story. It was made into a world news story. Mm -hmm. And it went as far away as China, as Israel, as Australia. Every world news platform run this story. And it was strange because it, it started off, as I understand, in October of 2018 as a, as a petty quarrel in a schoolyard between two schoolboys. Yep. And this was spun by the mainstream media. Six weeks later, or weeks later. So it, hap it happens here one day. Weeks and weeks later, after uh, celebrity lawyers are involved, weeks and weeks later, it's it goes viral, and you'd think it organically went viral. Well, it's, the video has been released. It, no, the video was released a month ago. Mm -hmm. This has been made into a viral news story, and it's been pumped like an entire setup production. Yeah, and it involved top celebrities. It involved top journalists. All of them pumping this news story, which at the time as I watched it, the British public were being fed a story. And I was contacted and told uh, lots of truths about this. I then reported and said, mm, hold on, £180,000 have been donated or £160,000 have been donated. So basically the story was a Syrian refugee had a bottle of water poured over him. The media run the story saying that he was waterboarded. Um, we were told that he was the innocent victim and we were told it was, it was a racist attack. Yes. <laughs> total lies, total and, fabrications. And as I recall it, all English mainstream media were running this story, the Daily Mail, the Guardian, the Independent, the BBC. And as I recall it, the, the star journalist of the ITV programme Good Morning Britain, uh, what's his name, Piers Morgan, Morgan. Piers Morgan. he was vocally calling for what, what, what severe retribution, severe retribution severe. against a school boy, boy a child, a, child a, a boy of 16, 17, 15, 15 years of age. 15 years, 15 years of age and he poured a bottle of water on someone in school. And when he pours a bottle of water and you can hear him saying, what are you saying now, what are you saying now? Mm -hmm. So it's very obvious something's gone on prior to this, mm -hmm. but no one investigated what had gone on. No one was told what had gone on. Mm -hmm. Everyone was lied to. Um, I reported and said, you're being lied to. Uh, for that, they come after me in a major way. And they come after me with lawyers, legal teams, put me through the courts. Um, 1.6 million was the end figure. But I've currently, they hit me through the courts. Now, but what they've done is, they told the whole country that I lied as a journalist. I wore a hidden camera, covert camera, and I went and approached the people who knew the truth. Who who knows the truth about what happened at this school? Is it Piers Morgan sitting on GMTV Britain who's never been to the town of Huddersfield? Mm -hmm. Is it Jeremy Vine who's sitting giving the boy's name out? Yeah, mm -hmm. basically directing people where... Who knows the truth? Well, it's the school teachers. And I found it amazing at the time that we didn't hear from any school teachers. So I went and wore hid, hidden... My button was... A, my, my, my tie was a camera. And I knocked from door after door after door to speak to teachers at their houses to find out what had gone on. Um. And uh, many of these witnesses, independently of, of each other, present a very different, a completely different version to the story than the one told by the mainstream media. But they all are also afraid to speak up. They will not speak on camera. And 
you then discovered that, that many of, of the, the staff on the school had been uh, forced or pressured to sign legal contracts and some of them had been paid off. The head, the head, the head teacher's words were hush money and uh, he, he threatened with his pension. Mm -hmm. So, and then teacher after teacher, we that's what I find now. I knock at an Asian teacher's door and he come out and basically said, Tommy, I took the money. I took the money. And you, as I recall it, as you, you, you documented this by way of, of you, you managed by way of some Freedom of Information Act to acquire information from the Kirklees Council outside of Huddersfield, which proved that they had actually paid about a quarter of a million pounds. 174,000 pounds okay. on non-disclosure agreements. And now one and teacher tells us 18,000 pounds he was paid. Now... And again, what were they paid to do? Mm -hmm. They were paid so they could never tell the truth about this incident or about the child in question. And then the next question must be this. Why do you think that Kirkley's council... Uh, 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 why, yeah, why, why did they... Uh, why did they uh, what motive would, did they have to, to... See, they would have thought, as everyone would have thought, that, that, that they actually shut down the entire school. Mm -hmm. So, and the head teacher says they, when I say they, I mean they. It was spoken about at the UN conference, this, this incident, because mm -hmm. this was world news. The child, the victim that we were told was a victim, was invited to Parliament by Sajid Javid. He was paraded with all the top celebrities and politicians in the UK, and he was portrayed as a total victim. Now, why do I think that they've, why do I think that Kirkley's council would have done this? Um... The child was one of 20,000 that were brought into the country as part of the United Nations Refugee Resettlement Programme from Syria. Mm -hmm. At a time when the British public didn't want refugees from Syria because of the ISIS conflict. Mm -hmm. Everyone was concerned. I believe it's as simple as they didn't want government policy being questioned. Okay. Now, if the reality could be known, and this was a, they were both school children, so let's remember the Syrian refugee was a child as well. If the reality could be known, the reality is that a child has come from Syria who has a lot of problems, and he has he has projected those problems onto other children in the school. Mm -hmm. And if people could be made aware that one of the twenty thousand had done this, 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 all the different things that were alleged to have he was he was, he was to have done, people would start questioning the government's policy. Well, hold on, you've put these people in our yeah. in, in our towns and cities. Far easier <clears throat> to silence everyone which is why the film's called Silence, because that's what they did. They used the money to silence everyone. They used fear to silence everyone. None of the journalists reported the truth. None of them even investigated the truth. We, we, they said on national TV, and this is where I have to be question, careful, because they've given me injunctions preventing me from talking about certain things here, mm -hmm. which is insane in itself. Mm -hmm. And you know what really was a wake-up call for me? It was um, I thought that this was about me, and this was about their hatred of me and their then conspiring to use circum certain circumstances to destroy me, which is what they done with this case. They destroyed mm. me through the cause. Mm. But then I realised it when I saw the Johnny Depp case, Johnny Depp was taken through the same court in England. The actual evidence that was presented of police officers' testimonies of evidence was totally ignored. And I realised that it's the narrative. All that matters is the narrative. Now, the narrative in this school playground incident was open border policy yeah, mm -hmm. and sympathy for refugees. Mm -hmm. So that's why they took this story and pumped it around the world. Yeah? They could portray me as a liar at the same time. But Johnny Depp, when he could leave, he was convicted by the British court of beating his wife. Mm -hmm. When he went to America and the whole world could see the case, mm -hmm. his name was cleared. Mm -hmm. Now, if the whole world could see my case... yes. My name would be cleared. People would realise I was the only journalist in the UK who reported the truth on what mm -hmm. happened in that, mm -hmm. in that incident. But that's why the judiciary steps in then and they bring in an injunction that prevents me from showing the public certain things. I was thinking, um, I wanted to talk about the ordeal gone through by, by the English boy of 50. Can I mention his name? Um, probably, yeah, you, yeah, you can, yeah. Well, his name was Bailey, yeah. and the ordeal gone through by, by him and his family. And then later on, talk a little bit about uh, the legal process yep. uh, brought against you. Yep, cool. Yeah. So he, so, so the other child, the, other, the English child, so at the time there were two children in a playground 
dispute. Now, no one was told the truth of what had happened on, no one was told the history that went on with this incident. Everyone was told that this boy attacked this boy because he was a racist. Yes. That's totally right. not the truth, mm -hmm. yeah? which we find out in the documentary. We find out the truth, we find out all those things from teacher after teacher after teacher, from school records and things like that. Now, he was 15 years old and he had day daytime TV presenters demanding severe retribution mm -hmm. yeah. from their from their listeners. He had death threats, he had gangs looking for him, he had imams, radical imams outside the school. He was vulnerable anyway as a child and he felt isolated. I remember when I went up and met the family, they were hiding. They were hiding in a hotel, the mother had spent her Christmas money and they had nowhere to go and no one to turn to. They were terrified, terrified. Now his life, totally spiraled after that mm -hmm. yeah. he had an attempt at suicide which we see in the film but no one cared no no one cared social yes. services you know his his family were relo relocated into a temporary accommodation that we we moved them to his two little sisters were 11 years old and they were out of education for three months only when the the council found out that the house they were in was my house these 11 year old girls mm. they then moved them and own they then panicked Mm -hmm. because of fear of radicalization okay they then acted uh, because i had to contact the council and say these two children have not been in education for months how have you ignored these children one of the one of the young girls was self-harming i said their lives have been destroyed and no one's been here to help them it was absolute failure of every system and did any english mainstream media report on this on these no, social consequences uh, no no made no no mainstream media even cared in fact the mainstream media all glorified and rallied against the family mm -hmm. against the mother against the children yeah. um yeah. whereas on the other side the syrian refugee had the support of he had a hundred sixty thousand pound donated to him mm -hmm. he had the support of the council he had to support of social services he had support of everybody mm -hmm. Could you describe the, the role played in the case by, by this Mufti Mohammed Amin Pandor and his uh, counsellor brother? In the case? I can. So, so, so some of you may remember in the UK there was a school called Batley where there were protests. The school teacher had had an image of Mohammed and then there were mass protests outside organised by a man called um, Brand, the, the Mufti, yeah? Mufti Pandor. Pandor, yeah. So Mufti Pandor is protest. He organised protests outside school where the school teacher is still in hiding from that case. Now, Mufti Pandor, his brother, Shabir, is the leader of Kirkley's council. Okay. So when this school incident blows up in the school, which is two <coughs> children in the school playground dispute, Mufti, his brother, travels from his mosque, which is a Diabandi radical mosque, travels from his mosque, there's 40 closer mosques, travels from his mosque to outside the school with more groups of Muslim men. Mm -hmm. Yeah. At this time, at this exact time that this school playground dispute was happening, the biggest grooming gang scandal in our country's history was in the media in, in Huddersfield. It's the one that I actually was sent to jail for standing outside court and questioning Leeds. the men. That's the case. Yeah. Outside Leeds, it was that case. So when, you, when we look and investigate it, we look, and it's a perfect scenario. Take the heat and the attention away from the problem. Okay. Yeah. create this problem that the whole world's looking at yes. okay. put the muslim community as victims and that's exactly what they've done in this case and when i looked so i searched for shabir pandor who was very vocal about the playground incident he's not been vocal about the grooming gang scandal no. okay. we searched for mufti pandor who within a two mile radius of his home there have been 99 arrests of muslim men for raping children mm -hmm. Not He's not commented on it. Mm -hmm. Not a wink on that. Mm -hmm. One of the men arrested in Batley, his hometown, mm -hmm. is another Pandor. Mm -hmm. So we have Mufti Pandor, we have rapist Pandor, alleged rapist Pandor, and we have Councillor Shabir Pandor. Mm -hmm. So we have one family who are all heavily involved in this case, but what are they all focusing on? What is everyone focusing on? A school playground. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. Then when the... When the legal and, it, when, when, and, and it's actually that council. So when, when I start knocking on the doors and find that everyone's been paid yeah. to remain silent and not to tell the truth, mm -hmm. who paid you? Kirkley's council. Mm -hmm. Who's in charge of Kirkley's council? Shabir Pandor. Okay. So the Muslim whose brother has organised the protest outside the school, whose yeah, brother okay. has come from a radical mosque, it's his council now 
who are making sure that everyone remains silent. Now, who's in charge? Who, which the head teacher asked the question, how has a young boy from Syria in a school playground ended up, before any of this hit the media, with the go-to celebrity lawyer for every jihadist in the UK, Mohammed mm-hmm. Akanji? How has, so we look at all this and say, how has this happened? This, and the entire thing is scripted, mm-hmm. which you then realise. The entire situation is scripted. £275,000 of taxpayers' money has been used to buy the silence of the staff. Whilst buying the silence of the staff, the media have pumped a lie around the world that no one can question. When someone did raise their arm and question, hold on a minute, mm-hmm. the film and the film silence is about looking... It's not really about the Syrian refugee. It is about the, it's about the story. But it's really about the lengths the establishment and the media and the council and the courts will go to to destroy anyone who steps in the way of their of their narrative. Yes, because the whole legal process brought against you by this uh, councillor Kunji, because of your uh, journalism on this case in Huddersfield, um, I understand that you brought various witnesses uh, who, who were witnessed that, that the story spun by English media was not true, that this Syrian refugee was not the innocent boy that he was portray- portrayed as, and that the, the truth was different. But, but how many witnesses did, did the opposition side... So, the so when it went to court, I produced five pupils from school. One of the pupils was a grade-A student who had never been in tr- who had perfect school records, who was studying law. She, she came and testified. Five children come and testified mm-hmm. and give evidence. To, to confirm your... To, con- confer- yeah, to yeah. confirm exactly what had been said. Yeah, yeah. They came to court. Seven teachers were on covert recordings conf- making confirmations. Mm-hmm. School records. Even the people who were hired to support the Syrian refugee in their messages that we went through in court. Everything was produced into court. The Syrian refugee... Bought not a single witness. Not a single witness? Not a single witness. Okay. Not one person come to court to testify that anything he said was true. And the judge found that the five pupils, who none of... The the most important point of this is that two girls went online and made allegations against the Syrian refugee before my involvement in the case. All I'd done was speak to the girls and report what was said. Mm. Now, as a journalist, that's my job. Yes, to give the other side. The judge ruled that it was not in the public's interest for the public. So so I wasn't allowed to argue that I reported what these people told me, yeah, because mm-hmm. he found it wasn't in the public's interest. There was no public interest argument to it. Even though the public had been duped into paying £160,000 to this child and his family, which was all set up and planned, it was a whole big scheme, yeah, he, the judge found that it was not in the public interest. So I then had to prove truth in court. So I wasn't given the protection that any other media were given. I then had to produce truth. So when I had to produce truth, I wore a hidden camera and I produced truth. I produced covert recordings and I brought five children to court to testify. The judge found that, in his summing up, that sometimes people lie and they don't need a reason to lie. He, th- he found that these five pupils, one of whom was studying the law, came to court and just lied. They committed perjury. So if it... You found that they committed perjury. So he found that everyone involved in this case, everyone from start to finish was lying, and the one person telling the truth was the Syrian refugee, the one whose entire school record was littered with, with him being a liar. And this judge, Nick Lynn, as I understand, as his name is, he then ruled that if you, he if ruled you produce if any I, of the evidence that you've, you've acquired in this case, you will be... Uh, I'll be imprisoned for two okay. years. Okay. He then ruled that... He ruled that, which is insane. Uh, I said to him at the time, unfortunately for him, which is what I said is, this film was made for an American production company. Yeah? The film was already in America. I've been going backwards and forwards with the people who have been in possession of the film, begging them not to put the film out, because I know when they, if they put the entirety of the film out, they will lock me up. Mm. And they'll lock me up for, two, for years on solitary mm. confinement, mm-hmm. which is insane itself. But what, what I ask the judges, if this is as clear-cut case as you say, mm. Why are you terrified of the public seeing the evidence? What did he answer? I think. And I've, I've got the recordings of all of it. So yeah. it's like, I don't understand. What are you trying to, why are you hiding it mm-hmm. from the public? Why are you hiding it? And why is there, again, 
why is there secret courts? Why is there secret rulings? Why is the public not allowed to see? Why can you lie to the British public? And and if I show them the truth, you want to, you imprison me? Of course, for a lot of us who who observe your history from the outside and and, and your last court case where you also reported about a grooming uh, case outside of Leeds Crown Court, you were also punished for for just for reporting. Uh, I, I asked him, how do you feel about your verdict? I've got, <laughs> got 13 months in jail. So, so many would, would heed the suspicion that some kind of political motive of, from people, political people in power in England must be behind this. <laughs> but here we have apparently mainstream media in England, many politicians and judicial authorities complying with uh, the interests of, of for instance, this, this Mufti Pandor who was, was, who was, who was, uh, who was uh, um, demonstrating very actively against this school board in England. What, what, what we have to ask, what, what are the implications for free speech in Europe if, and for critical thinking in, in, in the if West? this is allowed, yeah. there, there is no free speech. Like that, we're in a situation now where the courts have been weaponised, the judiciary has been weaponised, the police have been weaponised, that it's all political now. Everything's political. And the silencing and the ability for them to use the court system to take away our ability to speak, which is that I've got multiple injunctions now, mm -hmm. so I can't actually speak about things because I end up in prison, should be an alarm to everyone. The problem is, it's not an alarm to the journalists. They celebrate it. They do. They, they've yeah. all celebrated this. Mm -hmm. Rather than stand... Rather than fall on the sword of free speech, rather than defend free speech and defend, you may not agree with what, I, what he exactly. says, but I will defend his right to say it. Exactly. That is no longer applicable. No. They do not believe in that. Mm -hmm. They actually celebrate censorship, mm -hmm. that, as long as it's against certain people. Now, now, obviously, I've been censored, one of the most censored people in the world, because of my opposition to Islam and open border immigration. Now, that's shifted to covid to vaccines, to transgenderism, to Ukraine. There's all these, the, the goalposts continue to shift, which is why the opposition to us, or, or certainly journalists, you may find yourself on the right side of free speech now, but who knows where the state are going to shift it to? Mm -hmm. Minor attracted people, paedophiles, that, that all of it's shifting. So you may think you're on the right side, but at some point you'll find yourself on the wrong side. Now, and, and this is the problem, and, and, and because it was against us, but now we have scientists and doctors who have been censored, who have been silent. So I think over the last two years, a lot of people, more so than ever now, have woken up to the level of censorship and the fact that it's state-sponsored, the fact that big tech and government, we've seen it with the Twitter files of Elon Musk, it's all coordinated, it's all aligned. The government decides on who can speak and what they can speak about. And that, that is communism. That is a terrifying future for all of us. I think you're right that there is a great deal of acknowledgement that, that this is the case, but I also sometimes sense a, a great apathy. And, and what can we know, do? What can we do? Well, they've done, and what, and what, can, what can we do? That, that is the biggest question. Not just what can we do, but what are you willing to sacrifice? What are you willing to give for free speech? We are custodians of freedom of speech. We, are, we have been gifted this gift. And when we, when we say free speech, it's not free. It's never been free. Mm. Every single emotion, pain and suffering you can name or think of. Fear, every single one of them have gone through, people have gone through those feelings, those emotions, in order to pres preserve and protect freedom of speech. Right now, we have bred a generation of people who are willing to just give it away. Mm. And there has to be a mass awakening. There has to be mass moments. And, and it's like, when, what would you sacrifice or what would you give? Um, I, I think that, I, I think that, uh, on free speech certainly and on the exposure of the curtailing of free speech I think I've done as much to expose the curtailing of free speech and I know that I'll be able to look my children in the face and say that I did everything I could humanly do mm -hmm. in order to expose what's going on um, but this is the battle of our generation mm -hmm. this will be viewed as the battle of our generation yes. whether and it will, it will either be viewed upon when we lost free speech or when we won the, the battle for free speech mm -hmm. Like me. And um, and we're all playing this moment. We'll play it out tomorrow in, in Danish Parliament. I, for, 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 for me, so I, I want to thank you. I want to thank your politicians from Dan um, for. Well, you can do that tomorrow. I'll do it tomorrow. Yeah. For the for, yeah for the opportunity to speak in Parliament because in my Parliament I wouldn't get one step near the door. No, you wouldn't. You wouldn't. No. You know, uh, of course, 
there are many who, who, are, who are prejudiced against you, have preconceived opinions against you because of your criticism of Islam. When you were here last, uh, a mainstream Danish journalist uh, openly admitted to calling you far right because you were an Islam critic. And when you pressed him, he said he would never uh, call anyone far right for criticizing Christianity, of course. And Special protection. And he went then went on to say this is the norm in, in Danish mainstream media. Uh, but of course, you did make a documentary, as far as I know, about uh, a girl in, in Barrow. Uh, your documentary is called The Phantom Rape Gang, yes. where you, you um, also went up and made interviews. And the, the, the case was a girl who uh, claimed to have been raped by various uh, named men in her local community. And these men's lives were made very difficult because of her accusations. And you've actually, as far as I understand, you found out that, that her testimony did not seem very credible. Um, because didn't the journalist contact you and say that I was part of this lie? Yes. If I remember right. That's true. Yeah, a, Danish, yeah. a Danish journalist actually was copying from, from English mainstream media. How That's stupid why, they look. And they actually claimed that, that you had gone up to Barrow to whip up, whip up uh, tensions. tensions. That's what because the local politician said that. Yeah. The local politician made that accusation. It was all lies. They, they all lies. They, they, luckily, they, I'd recorded the whole last... Luckily, I'd recorded the footage. So bas basically, I'd gone to the town of Barrow. There was an allegation of a young girl who said that she'd been groomed, raped, beaten by gangs of local Muslim businesses. Mm -hmm. The whole town was turning on the Muslim, Muslim businesses. There's only 350 Muslims in that town. Mm -hmm. They were facing a big backlash. When I, went to meet, when I went to start investigating, I found that really what this girl was saying just on what she's saying can't be taken uh, as credible because she had told lie after lie after lie which could, could be proven as lies. Mm -hmm. So I went back to her school times where she'd lied at school, where she'd lied about this, she'd made an accusation against a man then and, and they were fabricated. Now if they're fabricated there's a risk that these could be fabricated. Mm -hmm. So from the off I took that, that stance that, and I went and approached the Muslim community and, 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 the, and the men who were accused of rape. And I started trying to investigate to see if there were lies, and I found multiple lies. So I started putting together a film, which was, I wasn't going to say the girl's not a victim, yeah? No, because Because I, I still believe she has been a victim. Of who and of what, we cannot determine. But mm. what we can't allow to happen is, is men's lives to be destroyed mm. just off of what she says. So that, and my journalism was exactly that, which is investigative journalism. I was piecing together the story. And you know, when I approached the Muslims, one, one Muslim man and his wife said, Tommy, you're the only one who's come to help us. Mm, it's interesting. You're the only this, one this story was never conveyed to the Danish media, never. His name is Paul Hart. He's a journalist in, in uh, Bergen, And he was just completely lying about... Uh, is he? Which, which is typical. I wonder if we can yeah. find him tomorrow. No, he won't come tomorrow, <laughs> I promise you. Where's his office? He's <laughs> an American correspondent. Okay, so the thing is, they take again. They take bits that they think they can beat me with, mm. and they use them. And the truth is the total opposite. The truth is that I went up there to take those Muslim men down. I went up there to highlight and show. But the minute I found any discrepancies mm. that questioned her her truth, and it, it would be totally irresponsible to. And and, I, and the police actually come in, and the police prevent me. They again, the police give me a condition. I wasn't allowed to talk about this case, I remember, yeah. which was insane because yeah. I, I was the one who had the evidence to tell people this isn't quite as it seems. Yeah? Mm -hmm. Unfortunately, the men and the family, the innocent families had to go through another two years of chaos. Unfortunately, I was in possession of evidence and information that I could have put out to the public that would have, would have ended the siege against these innocent families, but the police prevented me from doing so. Police, police gave me conditions that I wasn't allowed to talk about it. I wasn't even allowed, they gave me again an entire perimeter. I wasn't allowed into the entire area of Cumbria. I wasn't allowed to talk about any sexual exploitation in Cumbria. Now, most people have seen this case. The truth is there are grooming gangs in that town. Because I found, I, I sat down with Muslim families who told me that their relatives had been involved in it. Okay. So the, the Muslim community are very well, very open in, yeah. in that town. When I went up there, they all opened their doors to me. And, um, and again, I, I actually, as I said, I've sat down with the family uh, who were accused and uh, it would be totally, it's totally the most heinous of crime to be accused of. If, there is a, if there's any doubt, then these men's names should be cleared. Another uh, 
not just documentary, but series of documentaries that you've been making since you were here last, is your documentary about, you call it The Rape of Britain, where you interview various victims of Muslim rape gangs in the town of Telford. Um, you know, if, if anyone had made similar documentaries in our country, I imagine it would have been a cause of, of great media interest. What's been the reaction of the mainstream media in England? So what the media have done is, in the early years when they used to report me, there, there seems to have become, since I produced Panodrama, which was the expose against Panorama, the BBC, there seems to have been, and not just seems to have been, journalists have told me, they're not allowed to mention my name. So, and this goes for GB News as well, which is supposed to be our freedom of speech mm, platform. Yeah. That when Mark Stein started exercising his freedom of speech, they got rid of him. Okay. So that is still controlled. So we have controlled media. I produce these, these documentaries which show corruption of the highest level of police force who are working alongside the criminal gangs receiving money. We, we produce evidence to this. Not one journalist reported it. Mm. None. So still they, live off the, still they live off the ability to censor us where they still don't really care really that much what we're doing mm. because we produce content and it might get 100,000 views, 150,000 yeah. views. If we had our social media still mm. and we weren't censored, would be getting millions, tens of millions of views, and then they'd, then they'd be fearful. But their seem their tactic now seems to be ignore. Yeah, just ignore. Which is yeah. totally, which is totally a disservice to the girls whose stories we told. It's also even the, the the phantom rape gang, the man who was falsely accused. We put together an amazing documentary on that. The four documentaries we've done have not just been mishmashed. We spent eighteen months investigating this town. Mm. We spent time on the ground. We spent. To, uh, a year with girls, getting to know them, gaining their trust. We we literally tracked every movement of every ra every Muslim rapist in that town. Mm. I know the names, I know every business they've got, I know every car they drive. We had surveillance on them. We sp we've done a proper investigative report, not just a and a real detail. That, so when we sat down the twelve girls, once the girls who don't know each other. Name once the men are named three times. That's when, if you see them on our documentary, you know they've been named by three different girls. Mm, yes. So there's awesome. evidence. It, uh, again, I wouldn't. One girl saying she was raped by a man. I don't think it's enough to show who they are. Mm. There could be alternative reasons. There could be a history going on there. But when three girls who don't know each other from the same town are naming the same men as trafficking them, pimping them, raping them, beating them, torturing them, and in that town, the, the, the terrifying statistics is that 1.7 percent of the town is Muslim. 1.7%. That's mm. it. Yeah? There's hardly any there. Mm. There's 3,000 Muslims. Once you take away the women, take away the under 16s, take away the over 70s, you're left with roughly 1,000 men, roughly. Yeah. The police, the police identified 200 perpetrators. We identified 250. The independent inquiry identified 300. That means 20 to 30%, mm. just off those numbers, mm. were involved in raping in that town. Now, you've heard of Telford, where a thousand, there was 1,000 victims, five are dead. Five are dead. Thousand victims. There's only three thousand Muslims in town. Now you've heard of Rotherham. It's only a three point seven percent Muslim population in Rotherham. So one point seven percent, three point. I truly believe that these two towns have been used as scapegoat cities because these are the towns we know the figures on. These are the towns that have had all the exposure. Luton, where I'm from, is fifty percent Muslim. Mm. Yeah, we've got fifty thousand Muslims, not three thousand, fifty thousand. How horrific do you think the crime sprees are there? How, mm. how bad do you think the numbers are there? We'll yeah, never get the numbers there. We'll no, never get them. Probably not. Because the, cause the level of infiltration of the Islamic community... It, we saw in this Telford where 1.7%, the leader of the mosque, the leader of the council of mosques, were all involved. Then, um, two weeks ago on St. Patrick's Day, you... you uh, you uh, published another documentary, Plantation 2, about uh, the, the migrant crisis in Ireland. Um, and what are, what are the similarities between the problems in England and the problems in Ireland? What so in Ireland, I, I rushed Ireland. I rushed to get there and I rushed to tell the story because I saw something very different to the rest of Europe that's happening there. And that was resistance. Because okay? all of our countries have got open border immigration, we're all being flooded. 30% of the hotels in the UK are full yeah, of migrants. No one's really doing anything. Mm -hmm. In the Republic of Ireland, I saw a real, which looked like a women's revolution. I saw them on the streets, I was following it, I was interested, I was, I was seeing fearless, fearless people mm -hmm. who were demonstrating and arguing. Mainly women, led yeah. by women. So I went there 
I went there to tell, tell the story, but I also knew the negative image that the media would portray of me. So when I went there, I didn't want to hit the protest because I knew the protest would be alienated as far right mm -hmm. because of my, if I was there. So I stayed away from the protest and I really went with the objective of telling the women, let's tell the women's story. Let's, let, let, the, if the public need to understand why there's protests, let's go and show them why. So mm -hmm. we went there and we spent time with lots of women. Again, I wore covert cameras because I believe you get the truth out of people when they, because people are too scared to talk. Unfortunately, the era we live in is a self-censorship era. Mm, it is. People censor themselves. Mm -hmm. So I wore cameras and we heard from women and we heard that they're scared to walk the streets. We heard about the, the explosion in violence. The difference with Ireland is people haven't come to Ireland for immigration. People have left. So Ireland's a small country, a very close-knit community. It's a Catholic country. And all of a sudden, in the last 12 to 24 months, they've just had 100,000 migrants dumped. And it, it's something new. So when you see lots of Afghani men walking down the street in, mm -hmm. a, town in a town in Ireland, it's like, who are you? Where have you come from? And the same level of criminality with rape instances. We've so. seen rape, 14.9% 14, last year mm -hmm. it rose okay. in that one year. Now, it, what you can do is, which I was going to do, but you've got to fit it all into an hour, is I looked at the the rise in sexual assaults since open border Islamic immigration to Sweden. And you can draw a graph. Mm -hmm. So you have Islamic immigration and they're, they're literally parallel lines. Mm -hmm. Islamic immigration, rape. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah, yeah. You can do the same now at the start of Ireland, but you're only two years in. So as we go three, four, five years in and they continue the open border policy, the, 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 the lines will draw the same parallel. So the women are being raped, they're being attacked. Men are, um, un 60 percent of the men arriving in Ireland are undocumented so they're flying in just getting their passports and the political elite of Ireland is calling the critics of this societal development racists and far right as, as much as they are in the rest of Europe as I understand even more even it is very it's insane because certain political parties like Sinn Féin which were the pro-nationalist <coughs> anti-British they fought a hundred years to free themselves of Britain from Ireland yeah. so free get the British out and bring in the Somalis and the Afghans and the Pakistanis it's, it's insanity it's yeah. in, uh, uh, but it's all done and it's all uh, and the people at the heads of these parties it's like they've totally sold them out I understand they're also preparing legislation now to, to try to criminalise... Uh, They're bringing in new legislation which will carry five-year sentences for hate speech. Who defines what hate speech is? Exactly. We, know the, we know the problems around that. Yeah. But they're also bringing in legislation that you cannot... If, if an asylum seeker uh, commits a crime, you cannot identify them as an asylum seeker or you get 12 months in, in jail. So they'll bring all these men in who will commit all these crimes and they'll hide them all. And that's literally what you're seeing within the media and um, the media and the politicians. And the whole time why this explosion of crime, explosion of sexual assaults, fear in all the women. And the politicians are just going, we can bring more. Mm. And they've got 11,000 homeless, but they're not bothered about the homeless Irish. They're just not bothered about housing all these Somalians and Africans. And, and it's, um, but the, there's a real awakening happening. There's some amazing citizen journalism coming out of there. A mm. fellow called Derek Bly, another fellow called Philip Dwyer. It's so encouraging to see the new, the new breed of journalists, mm -hmm. which is the fearless, fearless, just, you know what, you know what, to explain it, it's like, it's ordinary people doing extraordinary things. Yeah. These are normal men who have not been schooled or educated or, 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 or um, promoted, and now all of a sudden here they are, and they're doing a far better job than any journalist in that country in exposing what's going on there. I, I find it so encouraging, and I sit there with such a smile, I watched a, a video yesterday by a fellow called Philip Dwyer who went to a, a military base and was confronted aggressively by a member of the Irish Army. It was so embarrassing. So that. embarrassing. Mm, yeah. but for, for, for the member of the military. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, yeah. yeah. Well, it is encouraging. It's encouraging, and, and the answer is that we need citizen journalism. We need to decentralise the media. We need to take the power away from the media. And hopefully that's what's coming in the future. I was going to ask you that. What, what are we going to do to, to get beyond the mainstream media? But you answered that we need more citizen journalism. Citizen right? journalism. Yeah. I saw James O'Keefe said something about decentralising the media this week. There's an organisation I've been talking to called Mice Media in America who are basically... They're decentralising the media. So what Bitcoin have done to the banks, they want to do to the media. Yeah. So the ability... So at the minute, at the minute, say for, for football presenters or sports presenters, you can only be a sports presenter if you work for MSP, the, the major platforms. Yeah. 
So they want to take that away and give the ability on this new media platform for anyone to be a sports presenter. So then you'll get real investigative journalists. At the minute, we don't, have, we don't have journalists. We have reporters. They report what they're told to report. We need investigative journalists on all accounts. We need them on the left. We need them on the right. We need real journalism, real news stories, which people are too scared to do if they're controlled by corporate media. Because when you've got control, you've got... As I said, GB News, which is meant to be the home of free speech, is totally controlled. The minute the minute Mark Stein spoke about vaccines, he was gone. He lost his job. Mm. The minute so you do, we there is a real need for a revolution within the media to decentralise it and take away the power. I hope most media is going to be that answer, but I believe that it's a hole will be filled, and it has to be. And it's a worldwide problem. It is. It's the same in in Denmark and in Western Europe, I believe. Well, I wanted towards the end here to to uh, to uh, to ask you maybe a, a a more personal question. You know, as someone who's been following the 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 ordeals gone through by yourself and your family with death threats and uh, persecution by the judicial system and and and, and uh, criminalization of you in, in in the media. One, one sometimes one one wonders where do you find. Where do you find the optimism, the energy, the courage to go on as, as you as you seem to do? Um, I seem so. I uh, my life has become so difficult here now. And I say here, I say in Britain, it's impossible. It's impossible to get a house, rent a house. I've had six of the ba- major banks close me down. Stripe's closed me down. Mailchimp's closed me down. PayPal's closed me down. So they have made it absolutely impossible to live. And what I laugh about is I think you've done that and in the last two years I've produced seven feature length <laughs> documentaries <laughs> which have exposed corruption at all levels. So I'm, I'm happy in that sense but I also am aware that the future is tightening and tightening and tightening here. Mm. They're making it impossible. Then the, and then they've not just hit me but they've gone after family members um, which has made it very difficult. So I, I don't like losing, never have. But I believe wholeheartedly in what I say, and that is the fact that I've got three beautiful young children. And mm. are we going to hand away the freedoms that we were given? Are we going to just give it away? Mm. It, everyone, ask yourself this: If you're sitting there watching what's happening in the world, is it a better place now than it was ten years ago? Mm. Are we going in the right direction? Are we gaining more freedom? Do you sit here confident and think, "Yeah, my children are going to have an eight, a great upbringing, and their children they're going to inherit a great"? a great safe nation they're going to have all these no you don't you know it's going we all know it's going so if if, if we do know that and we accept it which is so many people attack us because they don't want to accept it Mm. you know why because if you accept it you're going to have to do something about it it's going to question your manhood Mm. if you're a man what are you going to do what are you going to do you're just going to let them do it Mm. or you're going to to actually have to do something and um, and I I think very deeply always have about these sorts of things and about sacrifices given before us and I think that it would be cowardice not to do it. And trying to have this argument, you've, you've spoke to my ex-wife, Jenna. You've, yeah, try, trying to have this with her when I was trying to explain over the years that I was trying to have this to say, no, you don't get it. This is what's coming. And, and to someone who just wants to be a mum, it's like, it's a very difficult conversation. So I understand. And I, remember when I started my activism, I used a fake name and wore a mask because I had a good job. I had a good, I had a good income. Yeah. and I didn't want to lose it yes. so I fully understand all the people who are, yeah. are silent yeah. I get it I know you're scared yeah. I know you're scared but there will have to come a time when people are going to have to find the courage to go through those fears because we're in a bad place certainly your courage and your enthusiasm and your work has been a great uh, inspiration to many I think across Europe and across the West